Rest in womb, for nine months. Take birth. Go to school. Become a teenager. Go to work. Marry. Procreate. Become old. Die. Start over again. Rest in womb, take birth, go to school, become a teenager, go to work, marry, procreate, become old, die. Again. Rest in womb, take birth, go to school, blah blah blah. This goes on. This is the cycle, majority of the people are choosing, to go through. Does it look similar, to what, sheep, does? Doing something just because everyone is doing it. Just, to fit in. Yes. Most people, even if they follow this, so-called, normal course of life, never question, why, they are doing, what they does. This, why, possess the ability, to break this very cycle, of birth, and death. Once, in a blue moon, a lion, takes birth, amongst, the sheep. Before we start, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. Manushyanam sahasreshu Kaschid dhyatati siddhaye Jetatam api siddhanam Kaschid maam vetti tattvataha Amongst thousands of people, hardly one, strives for perfection, and amongst those who have achieved perfection, hardly, one, knows me, in truth. Lord Krishna Today, we are going to look at the biography, of one, such lion. A multifaceted personality. At times, can be childlike, joking around. At other times, assumes the role as guru, and can become a stiff taskmaster. To some of his disciples, he may say nothing outwardly, seeking to draw them closer inwardly. Despite of his hectic travel schedule, enjoys playing golf and driving very fast. The Biography of Sadhguru Jaggi Vasudev All of us are made of the same stuff, but see how differently each one has become. Born in Mysore, India, in the year 1957, to relatively affluent parents, in a Telugu-speaking family. He is the youngest of the four children, of two boys and two girls. His father was a physician in Indian railways, thus had to move frequently to different places. As a child, Jaggi was highly spirited, with a touch of rebelliousness. He was easily bored with school, and was a frequent absentee, and appear fearless in the face of authority. Rather than spending time in school, he would often wander off on his own to the countryside and become absorbed in nature. He owned a bicycle, and would frequently cycle on long tours. He loved sports and outdoor pursuits, and was interested in maintaining the best physical health. When I was just four, four and a half years of age, I suddenly realized that I don't know anything. I don't know anything means I don't know anything at all. To such an extent, if somebody gives me a glass of water, I would be simply staring at the water for hours on end. I know what is water in terms of how I can use it, but I don't know what it is. Even today we don't know what it is. With all this scientific exploration, we still do not know what a single atom is. We know how to break it, we know how to use it, we know how to fuse it, but we don't know what it is. So, if I saw a leaf, I'm just staring at, staring at it for five, six hours, I sit up in my bed and I'm staring at the darkness for the entire night. My dear father, being a physician, thinks that I need psychiatric evaluation. You also beginning to think <laughs> <laughs> so he is worried this boy is simply staring at something all the time. My problem is, 
I looked at this and I don't know what this is, I am not able to shift my attention to another one. What is this, what is that, what is that, what is that? By the time I am five, I am a billion questions. And nobody seems to know anything. Initially, they were all comfortable, I thought. They all know, only I don't know. Then slowly I realized, they have made a deal with their ignorance. Ignorance. They have made a deal with their ignorance. They have all decided, this is how it is, we don't know, you don't know, it's okay, we'll all pretend everything is fine. <laughs> I couldn't make a deal with my ignorance. So I just sat there staring at everything. In this condition, they sent me to school. <laughs> my mother said, you must pay attention to the teacher. I went and paid attention to the teacher. <laughs> the kind of attention the teacher would have never received in their life. Initially, I heard their words and sort of understood what they were trying to say. But after a while, I realized they are only making sounds. This will be very useful. They are only making sounds. I am making up the meaning in my head. When I realized, they are just, you know, hour after hour, teacher after teacher, they come and make sounds, make sounds and make sounds. I am making up meanings and meanings and meanings. Then I realized this and I stopped making meanings. I just paid attention to the sounds. After some time it became so amusing, a big smile spread on my face. But they were not amused <laughs> Things continued like this. About eight, nine years ago, the school where I studied over forty-five or fifty years ago, they came to invite me for their hundred and twenty-fifth anniversary. I said, see, why me? Because uh, I was not just a bad student, I was not even a student. I only went there when it was a must. <laughs> they said, no, no, our school has produced union ministers, our school has produced test cricketing stars, film stars, you are the only mystic, you have to come <laughs> So I went. So I go up there, uh, go there and stand up in the quadrangle to speak and I look around, same oppressive buildings. <laughs> then I look like this, this classroom suddenly it reminds me I'm twelve years of age. And those days I wouldn't speak, speak for many days at a time because when you don't know anything, what to say? So one afternoon the teacher is trying to get a response from me, he's asked a question and he's asked… I'm waiting for a response. I simply look at him, I say nothing, he can't make out anything of me. And after some time I don't even see him, it's like that for me. I know his past, present and future but I don't hear what he's saying. After thirty-five, forty minutes of this effort, he got so mad with me, he came and held me by the shoulder, shook me violently like this and said, you must either be the divine or the devil, I think you're the later. I was not insulted by this or abused by this. My problem was, what is this, what is that, what is that, what is that? One certainty was there, this is me. Suddenly this guy confused me about this also. I looked, is this divine, is this devil, what the hell is this? I thought this is me, this was okay till then. <laughs> Suddenly I didn't know what is this. So I tried to stare at myself, it didn't work, so I started closing my eyes. What was minutes, then went into hours, went into days and that is my spirituality. Next episode. As the word guru suggests, gu means darkness, ru means dispeller. Dispelling darkness. The work of a guru is essentially not to bring morality to you, but to bring spirituality to you. The difference is just this, one is an imposition, another is a natural blossoming to see that this human nature reaches its ultimate possibility. Before we start, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. Just because you believe, doesn't mean that you know. <laughs>
When around 12 years of age, one of Jaggi's favorite sport used to be, diving in a well, in the backyard of his grandfather's house, which was around 7 feet diameter, a depth of around 120 feet, filled with 60 feet water. The dive had to be so precise that a small mistake would be lethal to their lives. They used to jump into it and free solo climb back, utilizing the gaps among the rock. Jaggy was unbeatable in this game. Until... This man, of around 78 years, arrived. Moladiholi, Raghavendra Rao. This old man, saw them doing this, and goes and jumps straight into the well. All of them taught, that's it. The old man is finished. But to their aghast, he came up faster than Jaggy. He didn't like it. But he kept his pride aside and asked, how? The man said to come and do yoga with him. This was the thing which set him off to learn yoga. After few years of gymnasium, Jaggi was well built. He used to enter the ring against his yoga guru with another two. The man who was around 80 years at this time would pin them down within minutes. He used to give Ayurvedic consultation every Sunday from morning 4 to evening 7. One Saturday night, he was at a place 70 kilometers away from his ashram, and had to return back to carry on his Sunday duties as a doctor. He was waiting to board a train at night around 10, with two of his accomplices. But he came to know there was a train strike that day. There was no other means of transport as it was night, and he had a commitment. So, this 83-year-old man left his two accomplices at the station and ran 70 kilometers on the track to reach his ashram at 4 in the morning, ready to treat his patients. He was admitted to a hospital due to cardiac arrest at age 108. Not liking the treatment procedure, he had escaped from first floor window. At 108, years. He passed away three months later. Coming back, Jaggi's fearlessness and physical strength led to a lucrative job as a snake catcher. He would not use a stick but just catch snakes with his bare hands. He has had a lifelong closeness to snakes and the snake world. For a while, as a teenager, he threw himself into revolutionary politics as he became concerned with social justice. But after a few years, he became disenchanted with the levels of hatred and hypocrisy within the political movements. When I uh, passed my 12th standard, at that time it was called PUC. After that I decided I will educate myself, I don't want to go to college. This is a family where everybody is educated, not going to college is like sacrilege. At least today there is a little more uh, flexibility. Those days it's like if you don't go to college, you're finished. Because now probably if you don't go to college, you may lose your lifestyle, but you won't lose your life. That was a generation, if you don't go to college, you lost your life, you on the street, that's about it. So they were terrified of this. My father being a physician, he was just freaked about it <laughs> He is a very studious man all his life, first, second, third in everything that he has done. So he couldn't believe this, that I want to educate myself. So I did one thing and because of this suddenly everybody thought I've become some kind of an enemy and uh, they were not even talking to me properly. I did one thing. I was a… <laughs> just to tell you, I was such a big eater, I would eat ten times… eat more… at least ten times of what I eat today, but I never was 
putting on weight or anything, but it's because my level of physical activity was such. Uh, I could just run up a coconut tree, I was made like that <laughs> So, I was every day cycling about fifty, sixty kilometers, swimming in the Kaveri and going back like this, so eating this. I decided to go to the my city university library. Every day when they open at nine, I went, eight in the evening they close. That entire time, I sat there, read all kinds of stuff, from Homer to popular mechanics to National Geographic to literature to geography, this, that, whatever. Whatever came my way, every day for one year, I read like this, just all kinds of things. But the most important thing for me was, though I was such a huge eater at that time, this one year I went without a meal. Morning I ate as much as I could, breakfast at home and I went there and sat there the entire day without a meal, which was a huge achievement for me because without food I could stay. This kind of expanded my way of looking at life, but uh, you know, family drama started, my mother started crying, when the next academic year comes, go to college, go to college, go to college. Then I said, if I must go to college, I'll go for literature. My father said, what will you do reading poetry? You must become a doctor, he has seat ready for me in the med you know, military, med medical college, everything. I said, no. Then they said, uh, okay, at least do engineering. Then I said, see <laughs> Please do engineering <laughs> If I say I don't want to be a doctor, if you told me become a veterinary doctor, Ayurvedic doctor, at least a witch doctor <laughs> I would look at it. If I say no doctor, you say engineer. I'm not going to listen to this. Your problem is society, your problem is not me. So I just went for literature and these three years, I went there in the beginning and they all had ready-made notes, the teachers, they would read and everybody writing down. Those days fountain pens, kara 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 kara, it makes noise, it just irritated me. I said, I don't want to listen to this kara kara noise, I gave them a suggestion. If you give that notes wherever you got it, we will photocopy it and give it back to you. We don't have to come, you don't have to come. Then it… you know, if I'm there, I'll ask hundred questions. So they didn't like it, then I made a deal with all the teachers that they'll give me attendance. That was my only concern. So once a month I just… once a month I went to college just to check if they're keeping their part of the deal <laughs> My life is so similar, yeah. So I explored the geography of Mysore district in such a way, every village track, every hill that is there, every little bird nest, whatever is there, everything I paid attention, paid attention, just wandering aimlessly. But today, like when I went for the rally for rivers board where all the top experts are there, some questions came up and I just telling them casually, they said, Sadhguru, how do you know all this? I said, what… what was aimless wandering? Where I paid absolute attention to everything, from a worm to an insect to anything and everything I paid attention, now it's become formidable knowledge. I never intended to learn anything, I just paid attention because it was life. And this is all it takes. We have come here to live. At Mysore University, despite his usual erratic attendance, managed to graduate finishing second in English literature. After graduating, rather pursuing more studies, to the disappointment of his family, he set up his own poultry farm. Starting from scratch, he worked all day to create a financially successful business. With money from his poultry farm, he also set up an even more successful construction company. When not working on his farm, he would spontaneously tour the country on his motorbike, often at furious speed and taking extreme risk. He was never keen on planning, but would travel at the drop of the hat. A popular destination for Jaggi was Chamundi Hill. In these days, he spent time with a group of friends who were attracted to a more alternative lifestyle. For a time, they considered forming an idealistic commune, but it never materialized. In the next part, aged 25, Jaggi had a successful, if unconventional worldly life. But all this was set to change. 
On September 23, 1982, Jaggi made a typical journey on his motorbike to Chamundi Hill. He had no particular reason for going, he just often felt drawn to this mountain. While sitting on a rock, without any particular effort, he began to enter a meditative state. And now, yoga. <laughs> In his own words, he writes, Suddenly, I did not know which was me and which was not me. The air that I was breathing, the rock on which I was sitting, the atmosphere around me, everything had become me. I think this madness lasted for 10 to 15 minutes. But when I came back to my normal state, it was about 4.5 hours. And here I'm sitting, tears are flowing to the point, where my shirt is wet, and I'm ecstatically crazy. But, here I am, drenched with a completely new kind of blissfulness. Sadhguru later said, it is hard to describe the experience of enlightenment, but it felt not so much like an achievement, but as a homecoming, a remembrance of what we always had. The awareness of the infinite energy and delight that makes up the universe. When he came back to his normal consciousness, it was evening and several hours had passed. It was an experience that changed completely the direction of his life. He said he went up the mountain as a happy-go-lucky motorcyclist and came back a mystic. Enlightenment never happens, it is there, it is always there. The sadhana that you do is just to see it's there. The, the most important thing is, the perception of who I am changed. I'm not talking the idea of who I am, the perception of who I am. I went up the hill as a smart young man, very cocky and confident about everything. I came down as real nothing. Just nothing means nothing was left in me. I… I remember that moment. I came down around 7.45, 8, it happens to be a Saturday evening, we are in a construction industry and Saturday evening is the time when we give out labor to everybody. In front of our office there are some 500 people waiting and my partner, I come and park my motorcycle and I still got the engine revving and I look in and my partner looks out and he can't believe on a Saturday evening I'm not there, he just looks at me like this, I just looked at this entire scene. This is something we built. Built means like every day from morning five to eleven in the night, non-stop, I was on sites building this company. I just looked at the expression on my partner's face, he just looked quizzically, what are you up to, why are you not here, kind of look on his face. And I looked at all these people who were waiting in lines for money, the cashiers were giving out money. I engaged the gear and I left. That was my end of my business. Then I loitered around the town because I didn't want to go home. I didn't want to face my mother because suddenly she was no more my mother. 
somewhere, I was little struggling with that. I knew when I went, went home, I wouldn't look at her as I would have looked… as I have looked at her for the last twenty-five years. I didn't go there till eleven-thirty in the night. I wanted her to go to bed, but our mothers are such, she's still waiting. I put my head down and went and said, I'm not hungry and I went and locked in my… myself in the room. Because though something so fantastic was happening, I was still tr struggling between the two worlds. Everything that I considered as myself till that moment was gone. And suddenly I look at people, it's indescribable <laughs> Because so many things that you're involved in, it's like you almost died. I think this is how it must feel when you're dead. So many things you think, this is it, this is it, this is it. But tomorrow morning, poop, the man disappears. Nothing. Doesn't matter you cry, you yell, he doesn't respond. He's uh, completely gone. Just like that, I was completely gone. The person that I was, was just gone. People began interacting differently with him, seeing in him some inner vision. People spontaneously asked him for advice or to divinize the future. Even his physical appearance changed, with his voice becoming deeper and his eyes wider and brighter. This happened many times. One day I'm just sitting in my farm and I thought I sat there for about twenty-five, thirty minutes, but I have sat there for thirteen days. By then a crowd has gathered, India being what it is, there are huge garlands all around me. Somebody is asking how to run his business, somebody wants to know when his daughters will get married. All the nonsense I hated just happening around me. And I actually thought it's only twenty-five, thirty minutes, but these people saying thirteen days, he's sitting, he's in samadhi, he's this, that. I had not even heard these words. I grew up on, you know, European philosophy, Camus, Kafka, Dostoevsky, you read that stuff in America? Huh? And being sixties, you know, Beatles and this and that, I grew up like that. Me and spirituality are another world, there's no chance of me going there. So I had none of these vocabulary, samadhi, this, that stuff in me. People are saying, oh, he's in this kind of samadhi, he's in that kind of samadhi. You touch him, this will happen and people are trying to grab me. <laughs> So the only thing that I could do was leave the place and travel out, just to escape this, because I couldn't figure what's happening around me. Why I'm telling you this story is, this is possible for every human being. It's my wish and my blessing. This must happen to you. Whether you climb Mount Everest or not, whether you become the richest man on this planet or not, your experience of life on this planet should be pleasant. You must live blissfully and go. That must happen to every human being. Everybody deserves it and everybody is capable of it. After a year, he decided to teach yoga, and from small beginnings, more were drawn to his yoga practices, and this began the formation of his yoga organization, traveling from class to class, in his motorcycle. In 1984, he met Viji at a yoga program. They both felt a deep kinship, and despite objections from parents about caste suitability, they decided to marry. They had a daughter, Radha, who now works as a trained yoga instructor. In 1987, he toyed with the idea of developing his farm and making it a model cooperative farm, but just before the harvest, it burned down. He accepted this setback with typical detachment and took it as a sign to begin a new life path. Without any business entanglements, he devoted himself to traveling and teaching yoga. As more people became attracted to his path of yoga, a further change came over Jaggi, rather than just a happy-go-lucky friend, 
he evolved into a role as a spiritual guru. He could be strict in directing their spiritual growth and encouraging them to discipline their lives. In 1992, he formally established the Isha Foundation in the Velangiri Mountains in the state of Tamil Nadu, South India. Through his Isha Foundation, he teaches yoga, or the inner engineering. Isha Yoga Center in South India is a very, very special place. It's a very powerful space for self-transformation. Everything about the place has been carefully engineered for individual transformation of the human being. As his spiritual following increased, Jaggi continued to evolve. From a rebellious agnostic spirit, he increasingly took on the role of spiritual guru. Those who knew him well observed a shift as he became less familiar but more the role of a spiritual guide. It was at this stage that he began to be known as Sadguru. Although he had often been skeptical of organized religion and spirituality, his own ashram began to develop a sense of order and rules, similar to many other ashrams. He started to initiate people into the path of brahmacharya, the opportunity to taste the real freedom of Brahman by going far beyond limited human pleasures. In 1997, after a series of intense spiritual practices, his wife Viji entered Mahasamadhi. The human in Sadguru was distraught to lose his wife, but, as a guru, he felt a divine pride in her spiritual achievement. However, Viji's father made an allegation that she had been killed by Sadguru, though a police investigation proved this claim to be baseless. 1997 was a critical year, as Sadguru was hoping to initiate the Dhyanalinga, a spiritual energy center. But, his wife's death, put back the planned initiation. Around this time, the ashram was also attacked by people hostile to Sadhguru and the ashram, including the uncle of one meditator. In the local press, accusations were made about activities in the ashram. However, Sadhguru and the ashram weathered the storm by offering more yoga classes and meeting the skeptical local population. After many years in Tamil Nadu, Isha has become a valued part of the community. Sadhguru has stated that he does not teach a superficial spirituality which tries to just make people feel better. He instead seeks a real spiritual transformation which involves challenging ingrained habits and vested interests of man. When real spiritual teachers seek this kind of transformation, it invariably causes some kind of reaction from those who feel threatened or jealous by this different approach to life. The Dhyanalinga was finally consecrated on June 23, 1999, after three years of an intense process of prana pratishtha, a rare form of consecration with life energies. The word linga comes from the root word lina. Linga means the form. These lingas or these energy forms or these ellipsoids can be created with various qualities for various purposes. There are some lingas created for health, some for well-being and prosperity, for some for spiritual progress, some for meditativeness. Like this various types of lingas can be created. Essentially, they can be categorized as seven different ways. The uniqueness of Dhyana Linga is it has all the seven dimensions of it, but essentially it is tweaked towards meditativeness without any instruction. If you simply sit in the sphere of Dhyana Linga, you become meditative. No instruction, simply go sit there for ten minutes. You will become meditative by your own nature, 
without any instruction. So the idea and the science and the technology behind this is that you create an energy form which will do something that you want to do for a long period of time. A form is also referred to as a yantra. Yantra means today a machine. So it is in a way like a meditation machine. You simply sit there, you become meditative. Many people, this is the experience of thousands of people, they come there thinking they want to sit there for ten minutes, they sit there and they get up, it's two hours, they're sitting right there. Because once you're meditative, your sense of time is just gone. To become meditative means to create distance between you and your physicality, not to give it up but to carry it loosely. It is a simple journey from Asutoma Sadgamai, what is not true to true. Sadhguru explains that those who meditate and pray near the consecrated ground will be able to get in touch with a deeper spiritual reality and make faster progress. No particular belief system is needed, but just an open heart. I started planting myself outside a, main te a major temple here in Mysore because I wanted to really see after having a meeting with God, after having a conversation with God, how people will be. So I stood there intensely observing every face that's walking out of the temple and generally I heard local gossip. Sometimes in Indian temples your footwear walks away with someone else and then I see, hear people cursing the creation and the creator. I always found people walking out of restaurants as, or always had more joyful faces than people walking out of temples. <laughs> Divine versus dosa, dosa seems to win. <laughs> Sadhguru began conducting pro. to Mount Kailash and the Himalayas. Isha organizes all-night Maha Shivaratri celebrations every year. In 2005, Isha Institute of Inner Sciences was established in McMinnville, USA. In recent years, Sadhguru has traveled around the world. He is a frequent guest on TV shows, forums and student bodies. These sessions frequently involve inviting questions from the audience. Sadhguru has spoken around the world from the Oxford Union to Davos. He designed a large statue of Adi Yogi in February 2017. The statue of Adi Yogi was inaugurated by India's Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi, on the day of Mahashivaratri. The aim of the statue is to inspire people towards inner well-being, through yoga. This face is not a deity or temple, this is an iconic inspiration. In pursuit of the divine, you don't have to look up, because it is not somewhere else. Adi Yogi Shiva is considered as the largest bust sculpture by Guinea's Books of World Record. Sadhguru has been involved in several environmental initiatives, such as the mass planting of trees, along India's depleted rivers and also agricultural areas on Kaveri. Sadhguru has expressed political opinions more than what is usual for a yogi, and is recognized as one of India's most influential and powerful people. He says, he is not affiliated with any political movement and the most important thing is to bring spirituality into political life. He was awarded Padma Vibhushan, 
the second highest civilian award of the Republic of India, in 2017. I just, uh, in a field hockey game, I fractured my left ankle, and I went and sat down in a place, I was in excruciating pain, and by then I had also become a chronic asthmatic, and I had a very severe bout of asthma. And this pain and this inability to breathe to together, they were quite something. At that moment it occurred to me, if the maker of this body is inside, why is it that I cannot mend this from inside? I sat, I sat down with a certain resolve, if this is true, I must be able to allow it to mend itself, otherwise I must be completely on a wrong track. I sat down with my eyes closed for about little more than an hour. When I came out, my asthma left me never to come back again. And above all, my fractured leg was perfectly okay in little about little more than an hour's time. Armed with this experience, I started creating methods and systems through which every human being could access that intelligence and that capability within the system which can make a piece of bread into a human being. This intelligence and this competence within the human system, which is not just about thought process, exists in every human being, but unfortunately remains untapped. And I went about creating systems that people could make use of today, these technologies for inner well-being, these methods to engineer your interiority the way you want it. Millions of people are making use of it, enjoying the benefits of that, but the essential part of this is, that there is such a high level of intelligence and competence on every millimeter of the body, every point of the body, not just in the thought process. This is completely untapped by human societies. There are ways to do this. And as I went into this process, what I saw was, what is it that determines what is me and what is not me? I am capable of taking a piece of bread and making it into myself. If I look at this body, it is just a piece of this planet that I have borrowed, but why is this separate and this is separate? Then I found that it is just the boundaries of sensation which determines what is me and what is not me. Here there is sensation, so this is me. There seems I don't feel the sensation, so that's not me. You can sit here and not feel anything that's happening here right now. This happens in sleep to some extent. Or you can sit here and extend your boundaries of your sensation for this whole hall. And anything that is within the boundaries of your sensation, you will always experience as myself. There is a glass of water here and this is not me, that's very clear. But if you drink it, you just included it into the boundaries of your sensation and that becomes you. So if you throw the boundary of your sensation out in an expanded form, you can sit here and experience everybody in this hall as yourself. You can stretch it further, experience the very cosmic scape uh, like you experience your own body. This sense of inclusiveness, if it comes into you, when this came into me, I suddenly realized that to be loving is not somebody's teaching. To be compassionate is not an idea. To be in empathy is not some esoteric principle. This is the way a human being is made. If only he does not constipate his consciousness with limited identifications with things that he is not. When it comes to external situations, each one of us is differently capable. But when it comes to inner situations, every one of us is equally capable. No human being is better endowed than the other when it comes to the inner realm. A lot of the infrastructure of the Isha Foundation has been built on elephant corridors, really? something which both the National Green Tribunal as well as the High Courts have admitted to without the requisite permissions. We tell you this goes against rule of law which you stand for, this goes against living in harmony with species, some, both of which you have spoken right here at Nalsar. So if you could clarify okay. regarding that. Okay. <laughs> there, is a, there is a fan following for that also. So right now, all of you, those of you who are clapping and screaming, listen to me. You also, man. I don't know what authority you have to say it's an elephant corridor. The State Forest Department clearly has submitted to the High Court that this is not an elephant corridor. The Wildlife Trust of India has given a clear directive to the NGT that it's not an elephant corridor. The World Wildlife Fund says it's not an elephant corridor. But you say it's an elephant corridor. 
I don't know what's your relationship with the elephants. Okay? If you do not understand, right now we put up the map published by the Wildlife Trust of India as to which are the elephant corridors and which are not. And elephant corridor is not anywhere in hundred kilometers of where we, where we are. You can go look up the map today. Now, you can open up your cell phone and look it up now. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on my future videos, the more subscribers I get, again the better and more content I can continue making, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe.